Hi, good morning, everyone. This is Alison Hind. I'm from the IOSH Swiss Network. Um, thank you for joining us today for this webinar where Jonathan Dempsey is going to talk about innovate, inspire and influence. Jonathan has a very uh, varied career. He's been an environmental health officer. He's been a, a health and safety environmental consultant, risk consultant, I think he calls it. Um, so lots that he has in common with us. Um, but the thing that has flown through his careers has been his, his drive for influence, um, inspiration and innovation. Um, so this is what he's going to share with us. He's obviously done a great job of it because within the last month, Jonathan was voted as one of the top 10 global influencers in health and safety. So he's going to share some of those secrets with us today. Um, I thought I would start by looking at what we do. So, so the idea behind these webinars is to make you think, what are we doing for this and what can we do better? So um, I'm gonna talk about IOSH Swiss Network. Can everyone see my screen? So we, we do a couple of things and then this is our LinkedIn page. So let's have a look and see what we can see on it. Well, we can see, first of all, Switzerland is a very beautiful place to live. Um, and you can see that by these down here, that the, we like to talk to other health and safety groups and communicate. And um, we've got 72 members, so we're growing. Please join us. If you want to join us, you can find us here on IOSH Swiss Network. But then if you look down, you'll probably find that most of the posts have come from me, mostly about the webinars that we're doing. And what we really need to do is find a better way to make this a way to communicate. So. Having spoken quite a lot to Jonathan about how he works, um, this is our way forward. So please join the IOSH Swiss Network LinkedIn site and then join us for this challenge. So um, Jonathan's talking to us today and his recording will be put on our LinkedIn site soon. Um, but we want to think now about innovate, influence, inspire. How do we do these now and how could we improve? Now I've put some definitions down there. So think of what, what it means for you and please share your thoughts in the comments below. It'd be really interesting to see what people are saying. So I thought I'd start with uh, my thoughts on these three words. Innovate, uh, which is, I looked them up in the dictionary, to do something in a new way. So I, since I've come to Switzerland, I have a, a company here called Proactively, which the idea is to use technology, particularly mobile phones, to speed up health and safety reporting and make it more engaging and interesting for organizations. So I'm, I'm very much into innovation and using the latest technology. I think what I could do better is it's easy to collect a lot of information. I'm sorry, I collect a lot of data, but actually turning that into actionable information is really important. And that's one of my goals for the future. Inspire, which means to spur on and motivate. So what is inspirational? Well, I think showing something that's working really well is inspirational. So, you know, once again, my company, one, one of the things we're trying to do is report positive things and reward people for doing a good job. And then what I need to work on is I think overall having a more positive health safety environment message. So we're very familiar with the sort of negativity that surrounds the subject that we work in. Um, and I know this is something that Jonathan is really working to to get away from with some of his campaigns. And I, I would love to join more of that. And then the third one, influence, which is the ability to have an effect on the behavior of someone. So I think what is really demotivating is when you tell someone something, you report a health and safety issue and nothing happens. It goes into a black hole. So with the Proactively system, we have a feedback loop, which is there to show that you're listening and then we have an action tracker so that those actions do get done. Uh, if not, you know what, what you need to chase. Um, so it's about you can make a difference. So I'm hoping that that is influencing people to engage with the system. What we could do better is we need to take the discussion to board level. So we need to have the right data and the right vocabulary for having board level discussions for health and safety and making it a core business value. So that's that's where I'm working at the moment. So that's uh, um, a little bit from me, but going back to where it comes from, if you could share with me your own thoughts on those three words, where you are for them, and that would be great to hear. 
Right, I'm going to stop sharing now and let Jonathan take over. So welcome, Jonathan. Thank you. And so, morning, everybody. Thank you for that warm introduction. Uh, my name's uh, my name's Jonathan Dempsey, um, founder and director at Red Laces uh, Consultancy, and I work with HR directors, board directors, business owners uh, in the logistics sector and elsewhere to quickly solve business problems and develop strategic capability uh, with a bias towards safety and environmental risk. So essentially, risk and sustainability are a core to that. Uh, what you'll see uh, in, the, in the tagline or in the logo for Red Laces is creativity in a world of risk and uh, very different from a perhaps a, a more traditional approach to health and safety. But uh, you'll see creativity and innovation and just more ideas, hopefully throughout this presentation, which uh, it'll be great to, to get your feedback and your thoughts. I'm open to challenge and, and feedback on all of this. Uh, so. Uh, let's let's work through um, the next half an hour or so. Uh, this is the structure I'd like us to kind of work through. Uh, a little bit of an introduction into myself and a background, and then why influence matters to you. Uh, whether you're a, a health and safety uh, professional, whether you're a graduate, wh whatever role you're in, influence matters, and it will matter more and more uh, as time goes through. I'll then break down my career so far into, into kind of big chunk uh, items. So my career as an environmental health officer, uh, in the UK, that's a, a regulatory body. So uh, my experience in both food hygiene, health and safety and environmental management. Then into uh, sort of risk roles or director of health, safety, environment type roles uh, in hotel leisure, uh, bioscience research, uh, student accommodation, and then quite heavily with household names in transport and logistics. Then as a consultant and then more, more laterally through, uh, through Red Laces. So that's essentially the, the kind of the breakdown uh, and hopefully you'll see sort of influence to a greater or lesser extent throughout all of those. So starting off with a picture, this is myself. Um, some of you, I imagine many of you have been scuba diving before. If you haven't, uh, recommend that you, you try it the next time that you're able to. This photo was taken uh, in, the, in the Caribbean at Christmas, uh, New Year, uh, and I did my paddy open water diving course. Uh, so this is around about 18 meters underwater and, and this really kind of sums, uh, sums me up quite a lot. Um, risk and sustainability are captured very well in this picture. When you're scuba diving, every, every breath you take, uh, there, there's risk associated with that. Uh, and so you need to know and you need to have people with you uh, that are competent, that know your equipment and the equipment needs to be tested and all that kind of thing. Uh, sustainability, you, you'll have heard about plastic in the oceans and the, uh, the challenges to, to protect our, our, our natural resources underwater, but also the journey of discovery. Every dive is different. You see different things, you, you can try different things. So uh, there's lots of freedom to, to explore. So this really is a metaphor for, for everything that, that I'm about. And just in briefly from a professional point of view, um, from a uh, environmental health, I was chartered in environmental health since 2003, uh, chartered in safety and health uh, CMR since 2005. Uh, I joined the IRSM last year as a fellow member um, and my uh, MBA uh, dissertation, I focused on innovation uh, as a theme. It's something I wanted to explore. So a bit of background to how I've got to where I am today. So influence, uh, we've heard briefly already uh, from Alison, a definition of influence. Essentially, it's, it's having a, an impact, a, a making changes to uh, something different, uh, to use on people, people's behaviour, uh, influence in changing an outcome. Worth mentioning this point, that can be positive and that can be negative. Uh, of course, the context of this presentation is that uh, we want to be able to influence. Uh, and my whole reason for being really is about making the world a better place, wanting to make changes that make the world better, whether that's the natural environment, whether that's the pe people and the environment that we work in. So this is about positive influence, but it's worth recognising uh, that that's not always the case. So why does influence matter to you? What role are you in now? Uh, generally, who can use the word stakeholders, um, probably a bit of a management term, but essentially you know, the people you are interacting with within your teams and across your organization or the businesses that you work with are your stakeholders. 
And generally, we want to make things better. We want to make things happen. Um, and so there's quite a lot of uh, wanted to uh, get information across and to help people to understand why things ought to be done slightly differently. Uh, many of you will be trying to influence the board or the decision makers in your business. Some of you will be trying to influence behaviours of people out on the shop floor or on the construction site or wherever it is that they're working. So influence, it matters more and more. Um, and, and one of the reasons uh, from my perspective is that uh, I was always looking to go well beyond compliance. Uh, lots of organizations, if they know the rules and if they know the law, uh, which is often debatable, uh, then that's what they're aiming for. They're aiming for bronze. Yeah, if, we, if, we, if we're legal, we're safe, we're compliant, we've done enough, we can carry on with the business. Uh, and for me, that's that's, very traditional, it's very old school, and I, I don't see that as being very effective at all. So from a, a risk perspective and from a leading perspective, uh, then I'm always looking to go beyond compliance and therefore trying to help make the changes, uh, you need influence. You'll know, not even uh, just with COVID, but obviously the restrictions around the world uh, that are changing, that are very dynamic, a fast pace uh, with COVID, uh, workforces are becoming increasingly fragmented. Um, with lots more people working from home, uh, even if on a construction site or in a logistics warehouse, you've got people working on site. Quite likely now, a lot of the back office support and management functions will be working from home or working remotely. So there's a greater distance now between people who are making the decisions and need actions to be followed and those that need to understand what those actions are. And more importantly, understand why they need to be followed, why it is important. And therefore, we need to be able to recognise that it's no longer a uh, parent-child or master-servant uh, approach where you can tell somebody what to do. Chances are you may not be able to see them. Uh, and particularly if you're working across different time zones or different geographies, then that positive influence needs to come through different ways. And of course, social media is, is, a, is a way that to do that and, and internal use of social media as well. So it's more difficult for, visible, for leaders to be visible um, and it takes more effort and it needs more more different thinking. Uh, I think we also recognise now that pretty much for the first time, we've got several different generations of workforce at work together. And a lot of reports have come out this year that talk about Generation Z. So the sort of 20 year old kind of age group, the graduates are now looking for not necessarily a career, but looking to work with businesses that have purpose businesses that care about something other than just profit. So actually being able to influence your, your future talent or to be able to retain future talent, organizations need to be able to influence positively as well. Um, and that needs to be authentic, needs to be consistent. So influence is also diffuse or diffuse in nature uh, in, in that it happens over time. It's more difficult to tell. So if you talk to someone, you tell them what to do, if that's the approach, you know they've heard the message, whether or not they act on it is different, but with influence, it happens over time. And that feedback loop isn't necessarily there, uh, which is something I've kind of had a challenge with myself over this last few months because I'm, I'm putting messages out and, and content out and there's a lag between actually getting that sort of sense back as to, is it landing, is there anybody there and that kind of thing. It's harder to measure, so it takes some different thinking. So briefly then as a regulator, um, I found out a lot about people and how they work as a regulator. Um, going out to an environmental health officer and say doing a routine food hygiene inspection in a, in a Chinese or, or an Asian takeaway uh, in an evening. Um, and you know, one, one case uh, when I turned up to do routine food hygiene inspection, um, I, would, I turned up, introduced myself, uh, was asked to wait a few minutes before coming into the kitchen. And I waited and I thought, mm, this is taking more than a few minutes. So I walked in, put my white hat and coat on, went over to the wash basin to wash my hands uh, because I didn't need to ask them, do they wash their hands or tell them they need to. I went over and led by example, went over to wash my hands. Uh, and to my surprise at the wash basin, uh, there was a bar of soap in its wrapper still. Um, and when I ran the tap, the hot tap, uh, the water was coming out cold. So clearly uh, the staff there were not washing their hands as part of their uh, food preparation um, the catering operation, uh, they'd clearly put the bar of soap there just as I'd arrived. And next to that was a bin with a whole lot of food that was kind of steaming out of the bin. So clearly they weren't you know, confident in what they were doing. Um, some of that, I think, which is another good point, is that a lot of people fear regulators, you know, whether it's a fire officer, whether it's HSE inspector or, or any of the reg regulator, and, and there shouldn't be a need to. And that's certainly one thing I'd want to get across to everybody today is that uh, you, if you've got a regulator, you, know, you should be building positive relationships with them um, 
and learning from them. Uh, but certainly uh, that influence, being able to positively influence and explain to the, these businesses what they need to do and why and helping and coaching them is, is way more um, impactful in the longer term. Just something about powers. And for those of you who, who have studied health and safety or those of you who are working within a health safety role, you know, you'll be familiar with lots of, lots of these uh, powers. Uh, so some of the powers that I've used, you know, the obvious ones, powers of entry, uh, I've taken photographs, seized equipment, um, closed premises or parts of premises down uh, with notices, uh, interviewed people into caution. So in the UK, that's the same powers that the police have, uh, where you interview somebody, they have a right to silence, and then you, you ask the questions uh, and you can obviously act on that. Um, and I've also used powers under Section 20 of the Health Safety Work Act where they don't have a right to silence. So that's the same powers as HSC inspectors. And obviously, as an investigating officer, you have to decide which of those powers to use because that has a major impact on, on your investigation. Uh, I also use the powers to actually summon a police constable, uh, which uh, which is a very rare thing to do. Uh, as part of an investigation I did into a, a major accident that was reported under Riddle, um, I actually had a, a reason to to prevent somebody from driving a vehicle onto the road. So I actually called the police station and said, I need a police officer to come and assist me, which they, which they did. Uh, so... But these are powers, um, and, and of course, as a regulator, you don't have that much influence uh, beyond the organisation you're working with. So uh, the greater purpose of, uh, of being an environmental health officer, being a HSC inspector, it, again, is making the world a better place, making it a safer place, focusing on lives, the lives and livelihoods of people at work and, and their surrounding families, uh, protecting and enhancing the environment. Uh, but it, it's more on power and on influence. When I went into corporate roles, what I found was I didn't have those statutory powers, um, had perhaps authority within an organization, but it's very much more on influence, uh, being able to um, influence across a bigger uh, range of, of audiences. When I went into Hilton Hotels, for instance, I realized that rather than just in the local borough where I'd been as an environmental health officer, now I had the UK. So somewhere like the London Hilton on Park Lane, an international five-star hotel, with several million people staying there overnight throughout the year, everything I did around food safety or fire safety or health or safety, all the training I did could influence positively the lives and the enjoyment and the entertainment of, of hundreds of thousands of people. So I had a bit more authority. Um, I could require actions, but essentially it was influence. Um, areas where you, many of you will be able to influence in your organisation at whatever level you're at is to think about how you can... Uh, should make changes over time and across boundaries. Um, the more senior of uh, those um, professionals, I guess, uh, can can inform through and influence through strategy. So actually having a health and safety strategy, uh, I'm still surprised by the number of organisations that, that don't have a plan. So with plan, do, check and, and act, uh, plan, do, check, review uh, as a management system, many organisations still do not have a health and safety plan for the year. Uh, and many more do not have a health and safety or risk-based strategy that covers that. And those uh, those tools, those techniques can actually help you know, quite heavily to, to influence because they are collaborative. They bring organisations uh, and parts of the organisation together uh, to think and act more cross-functionally. Um, other areas, particularly logistics, but applies elsewhere, is designing risk into uh, designing risk into business processes. So rather than being called in at the last minute, just as a, a new warehouse is about to open, you know, please write a risk assessment because we're going live tomorrow. If you can actually get in at the design phase in terms of where is the, the new site going to be, what's the orientation, uh, what's the IT strategy going to be for the software that's going in there, um, how are the fleet going to work, uh, and actually get that design built in. Now, when it comes to commissioning, most of the hard work has been done uh, and all the teams are on board. Uh, and similarly, even with procurement, uh, procurement and investment decisions, uh, PP suppliers, uh, supply chains, uh, influence in supply chain. So if you've got uh, third party labour coming in, so particularly at this time of year when you've got temporary labour coming in for Christmas peak uh, or short term hire vehicles, being able to influence those third parties and raising their standards. These are all things that you will be able to have an impact on in some way. So then as a consultant, so I did some work for Ambassador Theatre Group uh, a year or two ago. Uh, they're the global market leader in live theatre. So lots of West End theatres, uh, the Edinburgh Playhouse, uh, they've got many of the states as well. And I did, uh, I was brought in there uh, with really with a blank sheet of paper to come and advise their board on you know, what kind of things should they be looking at? What kind of things should they be thinking of? And again, I had no power. And actually from an influence point of view, the influence was relatively limited there. 
because really um, I was dealing with the group operations director and some of the people I met, but essentially, yeah, they'd asked me to provide them with a report on, on things they could do. And it was ultimately up to them to what they did. So through different roles and, and different parts of my career, I've had sort of greater levels of or lesser levels of influence. So what do you think of when you think of influencer? Because this is probably a more typical uh, use of the term now influencer, it's social media influencer. It's about likes, it's about subscribe, it's about Instagram, it's about celebrity. Uh, and the first thing I'd like to say is I'm not a celebrity. Uh, and I'm not suggesting at any point today that uh, you should be aspiring to be like me or to become an influencer. Uh, it's more around taking some of the learnings and lessons from this and being able to think, right, in my role in health, safety, environment, risk, security, fire safety, whatever roles you're in, how can I uh, have a positive influence and how can I work with others? How can I uh, have uh, information and ideas that I can get across, but also how can I understand what else is going on, what's happening around me. And we'll go back uh, just before Red Laces, so kind of end of last year, uh, Nibosh, uh, global leader again in safety education, I'm sure many of you uh, are familiar with Nibosh and have done some of their courses. Um, they came and did a, uh, invited me uh, for a case study, uh, and this is on their website. You can see the, the link on here, so it's on their on their pages. Um, and and the title of the of the case study they they looked at back in my career was so you want to be an influencer. Um, and again, at that point, I hadn't thought of myself as being an influencer. I was just sharing some information. Um, they put this out um, this time last year. Uh, it went in their um, April highlights. It went in their it's in their October alumni newsletter as well. Um, so check out their website, check out other case studies, there's lots of other people in the health and safety and risk world that, that have uh, shared their, their experiences. But again, I haven't really thought about this as being influencing as such and reflected on that. On a, on a kind of related note, some of you will have heard of Safety for Good. Uh, this is a charity that was set up um, early last year by Simon Bliss of Principal People. Uh, and what he recognised was that he wanted to uh, provide a positive um, external approach to health and safety or what can our profession do to give back and, and be seen to to be contributing so we set up this um, charity which actually then provides lots of funds for other charities which are kind of uh, very well known uh, and james mcpherson who many of you will know of who's the host of rebranding safety uh, a podcast and youtube channel uh, and an iosh future leader um yeah we we're both ambassadors for for that and also, i'm also uh, his mentor um under that um into that uh, charity and many of you through I think through IOSH uh, through uh, other organizations there are lots of uh, future leaders emerging leader type uh, approaches and I recommend that you all you know, look into those to mentor or to mentee uh, and share again these are other ways to influence but come on to red laces then so um, finding myself you know, not in work around about March um, had a limited company kind of there sat there thinking what, what can I do uh, set up a brand and, and red laces, I actually wear red laces. I just, one morning as I was going out to a, um, a masterclass on, on uh, a business, um, I was just walking out the door, looked down, saw my red laces and thought, I'm just going to go with that as a name and see where it goes. Um, and so, and that's where it started in kind of around about March. So I've written a few uh, blogs, done a few sample videos, again, trying things for the first time. This has all been uh, learning my, my, my way through. I was based on one of my video um, sort of selfies, um, the IRSM asked me to write one or two articles and features. So I did a five top tips on communication for them and a few other bits and pieces. Uh, and I've just used that as a vehicle to really learn and, and experiment. So then social media, and I don't know what your thoughts are when you see this page, but the, uh, the essence I'm trying to get across here is that it's busy. There's lots and lots of people. It's a busy world out there. Uh, and lots of people are vying for communication and lots of people trying to be heard um, and trying to find their way through. But briefly, um, if you haven't uh, got familiar with social media or tried uh, to use it, uh, I would recommend you try, um, just have a little play uh, and start where you are uh, and use what, what comes naturally to you. Um, I put LinkedIn strong uh, in centre in here because LinkedIn uh, as a business platform is the one that I've really um, used the most. It's the one that I was most familiar with before I started. Uh, I've used Twitter and Instagram re uh, a little bit, but not really. Um, so, so LinkedIn has been the main platform uh, and also YouTube. I've started to use YouTube quite heavily with videos and then transporting that across. Instagram, it plays to my, to my, um, 
curiosity because I, yeah, I like photographs. I like visual. I've always liked that. So I like Instagram. So I've got a platform on, on there as well. We've got an account with nearly a hundred followers on there. Uh, Facebook, I have a presence there, Red Laces, but it's uh, it's not necessarily to grow it through the business, but it's to have, a again, another way of accessing um, information. Uh, Twitter is there, and this little logo on the right that some of you will be familiar with is uh, TikTok. So I've uh, got a TikTok uh, account, and that's really, uh, at this stage, it's not really for for promoting the business as such. It's more for trying out the technology and, and having a bit of a play and, again, being creative. So uh, seven months ago, I had no experience in branding or marketing or web development, logo design, anything you can see. I'd never done any of this before. Um, but I thought, well, I'll set about, set up the, the accounts. And again, all these accounts are free to set up. So, you know, the chances are, you know, you can set up a YouTube channel for free. Um, it doesn't, it's not overly complicated to set it up. You then just got to decide what to do with it. But you can start somewhere. You can start to play with some of these things. Uh, and essentially, that's what I've done. I've experimented. So I'm not I'm here to tell you that I've got a million followers or a million likes or anything. Uh, and I'm not going to be selling the next you know, fashion um, items or whatever, uh, but I'm learning and it's given me an opportunity to uh, really release a, a, and unleash lots of creativity that I probably didn't know I had, but also to uh, make the world a better place to help get some content out there and help other people to engage. So essentially, essentially LinkedIn, YouTube and a bit of Instagram, Facebook and Twitter and then a bit of TikTok. So this is a TikTok video I created. And for those of you who have heard of it uh, as a platform, it's mostly, it's quite heavily at the moment, has been uh, teenagers sort of lip syncing to, to music and lots of different trends. Uh, uh, quite a few songs in the charts now have kind of started life on, on TikTok as a five second clip and they've gone into like a three minute song or so. Uh, but more and more businesses are on there now. Um, if you follow any podcasts, Safety Justice League, for instance, uh, they now have a TikTok account and you quite often see some of their bits popping across over to LinkedIn. Well, I want to share with this, uh, this one, um, and you can see this, uh, actually posted on Red Laces LinkedIn a few months ago, so it's on there. And if anyone wants to see it, you, you can find it on my TikTok account as well. One of the things I, I reflected on was that compliance or the, the use of compliance, the language around it, is actually embedded in fear. So a lot of organizations are fearful of getting safety wrong, if I can use those sort of simple terms. What if we get it wrong? What if somebody has an accident? What if we don't fill that form in? What if we haven't got lots of paperwork to defend our actions? A lot of it comes over to fear. And also a lot of it comes down to overwhelm. There's so much going on. Where do I start? How do I make sense of it? And what I wanted to do was see if I could use TikTok to evoke a sense of what that like, what that's like at the start, and then working with red laces and, and, and really working in a more strategic and holistic way, how can we take that busyness and that fear and that overwhelm away so we can actually bring people on board and start to focus and get some clarity? And so in a 20 second clip, these are just three stills, but you see at the start, there's just lots of you know, signs popping, then we slow it down and then you end up in these fields. And, and just so you know, this was filmed in a field, 15 minutes walk from my house. Uh, on a mobile phone uh, and then played around with in TikTok. So again, just experiment. But everything I've done has been with a phone and with a laptop and, and, and no, no real investment in any tech. So it's just having a go. Uh, hopefully that will inspire you to all have a, have a little play through what you can do. In terms of YouTube then, um, I've run uh, a couple of campaigns. Uh, so going back at the start of the year, uh, some of you heard of Danny Schoolthorpe. Uh, rugby league legend who had a tragic injury that ended his career and he's now a public speaker in mental health and I saw him at the start of the year at a conference um, and I got a little selfie clip with him a little video clip just for him 20 seconds on Danny can you get you on phone uh, which I'd never done before I don't know where they've got the confidence from I just went and asked him and he did it so it came to mental health awareness week in, um, in the UK back in I think May or June middle of the summer and I thought right, I've got this clip I've got this 20 second clip I can put something out on red laces social media for mental health awareness week that might just help somebody it might just get somebody to to ask for help or it might just inspire them in some way and help them um and from that I kind of got the idea I wonder if I can ask a few other people if they could do a one minute selfie video and I'll have a go at playing with that and I did. So I ended up with 30 people across nine countries, uh, including people like uh, Professor Andrew Sharman, um, James McPherson, uh, Robert Jukes, so quite a few people from the health and safety world that you know, but also people that you wouldn't know from, from other sectors around the world. Um, and you know, that, that went out there and they're all freely available for you all to share on YouTube as and when you, you want to. And um, 
I then got on to uh, about four weeks or so ago. I was just, for some reason, I just thought women in business, uh, you're just thinking about how can we provide role models? How, if we're trying to make the world a better place, then one of those uh, ways we could do that is about create the environment. So if we create an environment of trust, if we create an environment of trust, then if somebody has an issue or, or needs some support around mental health, they will feel that they can open up and they can ask for help. If we create that environment of trust, uh, and somebody sees an unsafe situation or they, they can't remember their training or they need some help, they will ask for help. If we create that environment uh, where we respect and we value everybody, we will try and give everybody a voice and we'll try and get some diversity of thought. And actually, in quite a lot of sectors, uh, and maybe in the health sector profession in some areas, actually females in those rooms don't necessarily get that voice. So um, without wanting to, to really make any kind of political statement, I just thought, right, women in business, let's see where it goes. So I thought, right, I've got take the learning, what I've already done from a, the mental health campaign. Let's just ask a few people if they'd like to get involved. And we have now got 30 women uh, involved uh, from, I think, about 10 to 15 countries. Um, Alison, who's on here today, who's hosting, um, her video went up last week. I'll give a, a shout out to uh, Hayley Wright, who's one of our IOSH Future Leaders. Uh, her video I posted on my LinkedIn profile this morning. Uh, and all these videos are on YouTube. So at the moment, there's around about 19 I've already posted to the YouTube. And I put in a new one on LinkedIn every day, probably for the next month or so. And again, this is just to, to give a voice to other people, but also I'm learning from this. I, I'm learning as much as anybody else through these campaigns because I haven't scripted any of these. I've, all I've said is there's a campaign. I'm just looking to promote positive female role models. Tell me about your experiences. Um, and, that, and that's where we've gone to. So if I can do this as one person with a phone and a laptop and just wanting to make the world a better place, imagine what you can do with your resources, with your teams that you're working with. So in conclusion, uh, and we can uh, we can take questions. Um, hopefully, I've shown you that innovation or having some ideas, wanting to try something different, uh, it, it's there for you to make something happen. It matters more and more. Influence will matter more and more as the world becomes more fragmented, as people have less time, as there's more pressures on business. Yeah, it will become more. Uh, and as as health and safety professionals. As much as anything else, you need to know what's going on in the world and in the world that your business is operating in and in and where your people are coming from, whatever sections of, of the business or whatever departments they're in. Ultimately, I believe that we're all trying to create a better environment, uh, whether that's the natural environment or whether it's the environment people live or work in. Uh, and part of that means if you've got the, your heart in the right place, if you act with integrity and you show empathy and you care, and then you throw in some creativity and let's try something different then you can you know with your teams as well around you and your support networks and going with ios swiss you can actually then and with us broadly uh, and others uh, you know you can you can make a difference uh, we've heard about technologies we've heard about um, the proactively so mobile technology you, know, you need to know what technology is out there that can help your business to be better to do things differently and mobile technology is, I guess, is now, it's relevant and it's here, but artificial intelligence, virtual reality. Uh, if you want to train somebody in uh, safe use on a, of activity on a construction site, can you do that with virtual reality rather than sending somebody out there onto the construction site? Uh, how, can you, how can you start to think differently? How can you take some of these ideas and, and inspire other people? And ultimately, for me, it's all about people. And then just uh, if you if you want to keep in touch, I'm sure we've got time for questions. Happy to take questions that Alison will share. Uh, and if you've got questions that we don't get through uh, now, then certainly get in touch with me through any of these means, uh, through my own LinkedIn, through all these red laces. Um, and, and actually be quite creative with that. So anytime you want, if you want to uh, put a question in a little selfie video, seven months ago, I'd never done a selfie video. But all you need to do is if you've got a mobile phone, just put it on video, talk to it, have a go. Uh, don't don't worry about it. Just start somewhere uh, because that might just be something you can do with your teams. That's me, Alison. Fantastic. Thank you, Jonathan. I would say that two weeks ago, I'd never done a selfie video either. Um, and it was great fun. So uh, thank you for prompting me in that direction. Um, so one thing I didn't say at the beginning is that this will be recorded. Um, so I hope that's OK with everyone. Um, and please put any questions in the chat. Now, I have quite a few questions already. 
So let me have a look. Um, so this one came from someone who emailed me before the event. So super enthusiastic to find out how can you influence management who oppose investment with their health and safety uh, in their health and safety team and do not see the bigger picture of output from an invested health and safety team. OK, um, so thank you very much for that question. And thanks for getting that question in be before the presentation. I think there's a few things and we discussed this uh, just before the just before the webinar myself and Alison. I think we do need to recognize uh, the harsh realities that there are businesses out there uh, that are not are not wholly committed to make the world a better place. There are some that focus more on productivity uh, and increasingly you know, with the challenges that the businesses are now facing, the uncertainty that businesses are now facing and the lack of, let's say, strategic focus on risk, this is going to be probably a more uh, more frequent occurrence but i think that there are lots of things we can do as individuals and as teams i think certainly collaborating more across the organization uh, to get messages across of what we're trying to achieve but it's a two-way thing and what you might get across or take an inference from around influence is that it's essentially in broadcast mode yeah i'm trying to influence you to do something different I think we need to recognize that uh, it involves a lot of social listening as well and organizational listening. So it's worth um, prioritizing. You know, there are times you know, and, and focus that you, you need to have. Um, if you've got something that's part of a strategic plan, part of your annual health and safety plan, uh, that's going to carry more weight. But actually finding out what other parts of your business are doing as well and seeing where you can align uh, to make better use of resources. So if your, if your HR system if your HR function is looking at a new payroll system or a new software, is there something that you can work with HR to look at sickness absence? Because if you take manual handling or ergonomics, for instance, chances are a third of your lost time injury or lost time uh, cost is through manual handling and ergonomics. Uh, in my experience, most organizations, the HR don't really track sickness absence very well. Uh, you may have some occupational health support that has a, some track on there. You may have some accidents and incident statistics around manual handling injuries, and then a lot of it goes un unreported. Now, if you can uh, get a better picture of what the current state of play is in your business, track that and then put some interventions in place, you can actually start to release value back into the business by working with HR, which is going to reduce the suffering. It's going to reduce the, the cost as well. So there, there are lots of different ways to do it, uh, but it starts, with, uh, it starts with where you are and understanding what else is going on. Mm, yeah, that's a difficult one, isn't it? Um, so this question is from Joe. What kind of blogs do you put out there, Jonathan? Expert comment, thought provoking, sharing info, etc. What content? What content do you feel stimulates engagement? I've used I've used all sorts. Um, I think there's a. I think the starting point is that you need to be saying something of value, and what what I what I always put out is original content. Um, so rightly or wrongly i'm not saying what i do is right or, or the best way uh, but i share my experiences my insight and sometimes it's in long form so i put out a blog uh, back in sort of march april time that actually based on my two little lasso ducks uh, and it's, we just had some snowfall i think around about march the 6th and i, and I used the analogy that literally overnight my, my dogs went out into the garden for a run around and um their whole environment literally changed overnight the senses, the smells, the sounds, everything, because it was covered in snow and they, they were unfamiliar with it, but just didn't know what to, what to do about it. So I put a blog out there that, that drew people in with a bit of a story, a bit of a sense that they could relate to, and then started to talk about a couple of the key things I saw would be a challenge through COVID, you know, when it just started, one of which was that uh, cyber security would, would become a real big issue. Uh, another one was that mental health would become a really big issue. And the other one was that uh, businesses would continue, many of them, in focus on the, the immediacy of the risk they see in front of them, as opposed to taking a holistic approach to risk. So take an example. If you're starting to use your build, your buildings less, um, are you still doing your legionality checks, your fire safety checks and all that kind of thing? If you're starting to put one-way systems around your cafes, your restaurants and hotels, are you putting up temporary structures and not thinking about your fire safety strategy and plan because it's COVID at all costs? Uh, so I put that out. So, But sometimes I'll put out something like five top tips. Sometimes I'll put out a video. And I've tended to use lots of different video formats because I think that's actually something people can pick up on the go. 
I don't think there's one one that works. I think it's rec recognizing there are different audiences and different times that people want to to access information. So as much as anything else, that's why I've got six channels because some people will want to go on LinkedIn and feel very formal and feel very businessy. Some people will like to just watch a quick video on Instagram whilst they're you know, whilst they're out for a run, whatever it might be. So we we'll, we'll think you just need to be authentic. That the, the, the starting point is be authentic and work. Use something that you enjoy doing. If you enjoy doing it then that's going to make the biggest impact. Okay. An interesting question from Anthony. One fear I deal with every day that you haven't mentioned and involves a great deal of influence to resolve is the fear of liability, both on a personal and commercial view. How can this impact on health and safety considerations? From a, so from a personal liability point of view, ordinarily, if you're thinking in a, in a workplace context, unless you do something uh, reckless, or unless you are negligent in some gross way, then personal liability, um, it, it's not something, I, it's something you should be mindful of, but if you, you know, as an employee, clearly you, you, know, you have a, a legal ob obligation you know, to look after yourself and others, to, to follow the training you have. I, I would probably want to know more as to where that fear comes from, because that for me is a, it's not necessarily a rational fear. I don't think any of you here listening to this today should have any personal fear around liability. I think if you have, then let, let's have a separate conversation. Because again, remember what I said about the TikTok video as well. You know, a lot of organizations at board level and senior levels have that fear. And that fear puts, puts them in a very defensive position and in a very transactional mindset. It's a, well, I've got to comply with the rules. I've got to tick that box. Uh, and once I've ticked that box, I'm, I'm done. Um, so it's a very uh, defensive and very minimalist approach as opposed to creative and strategic. So I'm happy, I, I, I understand the question, but I'd, I'd be curious to know what's driving that. Mm. It's an interesting answer because when I speak to HSE regulators, they give the same answer that actually, you know, if you're not doing anything wrong, then you have nothing to fear. Um, yeah. But it, it, it's very difficult from inside an organization or from being consultant to, to trust um, for that. Yeah. And that's one, of, that's one of the reasons why I really wanted to put across the point around the regulators today, because I've been an environmental health officer, so I've had the same powers as HSE inspectors, uh, more so in many respects, because I regulated food safety under the Food Safety Act and Environment and the Environmental Protection Act. So I've had a lot more complexity from a legislation point of view to deal with mm -hmm. uh, and prosecuted. So I've prosecuted uh, a national retailer uh, under health and safety legislation. Uh, I was cross-examined by a barrister for three and a half hours in a three and a half day trial that I won. Um, and I'm going to prosecute in food, food safety and health and safety. So as a former regulator, you might think that I would say, yeah, you need to comply with the law. You need to focus on rules. But actually, I think hopefully what you'll see is some surprise that actually having been a regulator, this presentation wasn't about following the rules. Yeah. Good question here from Richard. Um, any feedback on errors to avoid on such communication platforms? I think so if you're opinionated, I mean, some people are opinionated and certainly on LinkedIn, there are people who are delib deliberately, so let's say inflammatory or opinionated. Uh, I think if you're going down that road, then again, you need to be authentic. If that's you and you're happy with that, then that's fine. Um, I'm not so uh, opinionated and I'm very, I suppose, courteous and careful. So um, I'm, I'm reluctant. I try not to offend. And so I act with or. Well, seek to act, you know, be authentic, act with integrity and, and show empathy and care. So on that basis, I don't think there's anything that, that I try to avoid. Um, just be open to feedback and challenge. And if I do inadvertently offend or say something out of turn or, or get the tone wrong, then then, then, I, then, yeah, then I'll apologise. But I don't think there's anything to, um, uh, to, to be wary of. I think you've got, you, you need to be mindful of, I think if you're a parent, I think you need to be mindful of uh, exploitation. Yeah, there are clearly people out there who use social media for uh, for, for not honest ends. Um, so I think you need to be mindful of that. Uh, from a privacy point of view, I think you need to be careful of uh, any privacy settings on any software or any devices. Uh, obviously, if you're using um, you know, software or devices in sort of coffee shops and elsewhere, thinking about privacy settings and, and, and people who can access your information. So I think being, being careful in those respects, but again, not from a point of fear, just from a point of, of being informed. Mm -hmm. Okay. This question is from Chris Drum, who later down says that, let me have a look. Um, he's an instructional engineer in health and safety, and he thinks that clients seem terrified to go down this route. But his question was, what format is the most popular at the moment? YouTube, blog, TikTok, etc. 
Well, YouTube is it's going to run by with Google. So I think yeah, from a search engine point of view, uh, that's yeah, that's growing fastly. Uh, TikTok is TikTok's growing exponentially. It's got something like a billion users, but not at a business point. But I think what you find is over a period of time that a lot of these software platforms age up. So whereas Facebook, you know, fifteen years ago, Facebook was for teenagers. Uh, now, you know, my mother-in-law is is on Facebook. Um, you know, TikTok is, is is going to go through that way. Um, so. Uh, I would worry. I would worry less about which platform is the strongest or the best. I think it's you know who is your audience and what's your message. What do you want to try and get out there? Uh, and it may well be that from a social point of view, you know you really like using Facebook. But from a starting to get your messages out there, LinkedIn might be the one that you would choose. Or if you really like doing videos or your know, photography and videography is one of your passions. Then, then YouTube might be where you start. Uh, many of them you can cross fertilize. So you can take something from Instagram onto you know, somewhere else. You can take something from TikTok onto somewhere else. So it depends on what you're trying to achieve. But but I would, what I would say is just go and have a little look, go and have a play, go and go and see what the software can do. Uh, and you know, blur those boundaries between your your personal and your professional life to see how how one can uh, benefit the other. Okay. All right. From Patrick. Can influence be built into a policy in the workplace? It's an interesting question. I'm not sure what policy you'd want it to be introduced into. I, I, my instinct, my instinct is to say no. Um, this isn't something that because when we talk about policy, we're largely talking about organization roles responsibilities uh, and ultimately something that should happen because if you've got a policy like many safety policies and lots of organizations they're just words because they don't actually drive what happens so my instinct is to say no uh, it's not something that would go into a policy uh, having said that uh, being able to have influence in an organization um, may influence the policy framework and what goes into it Okay, one from Gradinha here, um, who, this is what I said I was going to work at and you do so well. How do you shift perceptions about the traditional views of health and safety? Very narrow and limited opportunity to influence outside the narrow boundaries within the organisation. I'm smiling because people that know me know that I barely ever use the word health and safety. I, I, I just I just don't so um, so this is why I talk about risk and sustainability so um, well starting point you know the name of my company could have been Jonathan Dempsey Safety Limited it could be Safety and Risk Limited uh, but what is the name of, of of my consultancy it's Red Laces which is visual it's creative it's a talking point uh, and then what's the what's the tagline you know creativity in a world of risk where, where in that does, does it talk about safety it doesn't, but it's implicit throughout it. Of course, safety is part of my DNA. Uh, of course, so is you know, broader risk and sustainability. So again, you need to be authentic uh, and you need to start with where you are. But the language of health and safety, the traditional approaches around health and safety, they are very transactional. They're very rule-based. And in many organizations are not relevant to the business in as much as the safety team is a bolt-on. Uh, and then the health and safety professionals say, well, we've now got fire safety bolted on and we've now got food safety bolted on and security bolted on, largely because the business just sees safety as a compliance function. So anything that is rules and regulations, we'll give it to the safety team, as opposed to something that's much more transformational, which is around really understanding that value. And this is where having a, a say, a health and safety strategy or a strategic approach to safety and environmental risk helps you to change the narrative because you can then start to talk about the themes and act cross-functionally so if we take uh, say logistics yeah in logistics i would go in and, and uh, one of the first things i would do or even a student accommodation you know wherever i've, I've been uh, look at the top five risks for the business from a safety and environmental risk point of view and in logistics number one is going to be workplace transport is the biggest you know cause of fatality and major injury but that's not the work of the safety team because if we look at workplace transport, who, who has an impact on or an influence on uh, workplace transport in, in logistics? You've got operations, you've got engineering, you've got fleet. Uh, and it surprises me, still surprises me that even in market leaders in transport and logistics, you can go to a warehouse and you'll look in the yard and you'll find um, 
things could, that could be improved on in the yard and you'll go to the, the the hub or the depot manager and you'll talk to them about it and they'll say that's not nothing to do with me that's the fleet team so ordinarily you'd think it's somebody who's the hub or depot manager is looking after everything within that fence or everything within the boundaries and it isn't so many functions so many businesses are operating in silos and actually if we can start to or get the business acting more strategically and more holistically we have a much bigger impact on safety risk without talking about health and safety mm, interesting okay uh, there's a couple of comments here that i'm just going to read out so one was from anthony who asked the question about liability and he says um, his question was directed to someone or an organization do everything to slope the responsibility onto others mm. you see that happening I think whether an organization tries to use those words slope responsibilities onto someone else that doesn't change liability so liability so you've got so your liability essentially comes from a statutory point of view which is in law so the health and safety of work act in the uk will tell you and the regulations are going up will tell you what the liabilities are and where they sit and essentially it's you know you're looking at corporate manslaughter and the like you you're looking at the most senior managers first unless somebody's willfully done something wrong and then from a personal liability point of view again it, it comes down to civil law and and, from, and so so your liabilities aren't, aren't going to change in any sense because a manager or somebody's sloping their shoulders yeah, accountability will will be there ultimately uh, but i think i come back to what we said earlier on this isn't about sugarcoating and saying that you know, we've now got influence, we've now got social media, so now we can make the world a better place. Again, we need to uh, acknowledge that there are lots of organisations that do not run their business in the ways that perhaps we would like to. Uh, there are lots of chief executives, lots of board directors and, and senior managers, business owners that do not do things in the way that we would want to. And, and we're not necessarily going to be able to change all of that we can influence and we can do things to help. Some of that is by the language we use, it's about how we act, it's about the priorities we set, it's about the insights we can bring. I think one of the things that we can really do, which we haven't touched on really, is really showing that we understand and have empathy with people's current situations. So the example I gave in a similar presentation recently was that in one organization I, I was, uh, I was in as a head of technical services, head of horticultural services, lots of bits and pieces. I was actually manually, manually harvesting carrots with one of my teams in a field in January. You know, I'm hands and knees taking these carrots out of the field in about two degrees centigrade. The following week, I was in a commercial glass greenhouse um, harvesting tomatoes in 40 degrees, getting covered in all this kind of green gloopy type stuff. And actually by spending time with my team or spending time with teams and them actually seeing that I can understand what their challenges are, that had a major impact on how they perceived me and then everything that I wanted to bring. So I think there's, there's something about uh, in the same way that we would want uh, board directors to get out of the boardroom and onto the site to see and experience. There's something about the health and safety professionals as well also being visible and being visible as somebody that can come and, and see what it's like to do what's being asked for and share some of that. So, so influence, we've talked a lot about social media, and of course that is something that is, is more accessible now than ever before, but it's one form of communication and it's one form of influence. So it's not to take away from being visible and really understanding what it's like and finding out what it's like. Yeah, reading the comments here, Robert very much agrees with you. Uh, whilst the use of various technology can assist with influencing, we must not lose sight of the influencing people face to face by what we say and do. So just what you're talking about there. Yeah. Um, we have a question here from Emmanuel. What were the main challenges you encountered as starting as a consultant and how did you overcome them? I think what, what, one of the biggest challenges has been actually generating leads because you know, it's right at the start of COVID. So being essentially taking 20 years of uh, professional uh, and leadership expertise into a consultancy, it wasn't the best time to do that. So, so that's probably been one of the bigger challenges, but um, I think what it has given me is, is just that time and space to reflect and also that freedom to really try something new. Uh, because as we uh, probably goes to come out next year and the world kind of settles down a little bit, um, you know, digital is, is going to be the way that the world is. And those brands, that, those brands that have purpose, remember I said before about the Gen Z kind of really focusing on that, those brands that have got purpose, that are committed to something more than just profit, uh, and those that have a, a presence and, and uh, people can engage with and interact with, 
are the ones that are going to uh yeah the ones that are going to you know, take things forward so um, i kind of play a bit of a, a longer game in this and again one of the things i've not really mentioned earlier on is that um I'm very interactive with Red Laces. So uh, both in this campaign, the Women in Business campaign, and the previous one on mental health, there were several people who follow Red Laces and interact with Red Laces social media who I invited to get involved in the campaign. Um, the next campaign in November is going to be, uh, what does risk mean to me? And again, it'd be very creative, you know, picking up on different people across the world. Uh, and then into December, I'm looking at probably sustainability. So coming a bit more back to the core value proposition of what Red Lace is about, risk and sustainability and, and, and health and safety type stuff. So, um, so you know, people that engage with, because I, I run all the accounts, so I, you know, I interact with people. So I think that's different. You know, there aren't, if you look on LinkedIn and, and think, uh, you know, LinkedIn, we've got something like 620 followers on the business page now, which in seven months you know, is more than lots of companies have got in, in 10 years. But what you'll see if you look through that is lots of interaction. Um, so the LinkedIn business page isn't just a page to see my latest post. It's, a, it's an opportunity to engage and interact and share your thoughts uh, and share ideas as well. So it's a it's a way to learn and it's also on demand. So um, I think providing that access, it's uh, yeah, if you if you are a health and safety manager, you, you don't want your phone to be on 24 hours a day. I know it's a 24 hour roll call, after, but you need to sleep. You need to take time out for yourself. But if you've got content that people can access, if you've got something on a, your own YouTube channel or, or something where they can get information in a format that isn't just reading policies, that's going to help the engagement. Mm -hmm. Do you know, we've, we've reached 12 o'clock, but there's a couple more questions. So I'm going to keep going if that's okay, Jonathan. So sure. this one's from Abdul Quadri. Um, how can you convince a client who wants you to take some health and safety decisions that you think is not in line with your own framework or not perceived to be the right way? Can you clarify the question? Um, I think they want you to write something in, the, in your report that you don't agree with <laughs> so they can use it in evidence. That might be putting it a bit bluntly. I, th I think you... Right, so... How, how, do, how do you convince them that you're not going to do that, but you don't want to upset them because you still want them to be your client tomorrow? Or perhaps you don't. Well, the perhaps you don't is perhaps one. Uh, so if, again, so you need to have integrity and you need to be authentic and you need to recognise your, your own um your own commitments, your own liabilities as well. I think if you're if you're a consultant, uh, you know you, you you can again not using the scare tactics, but you, know, you need to be able to stand by what you put in your report. Uh, so if you're if you're saying that there's something you would not choose to put in your report, and your client is choosing asking you to, I would trust your own instincts. I, I, he, he didn't actually say put in the report that, that <laughs> yeah. was my words and I think that was perhaps a bit over the top but I think yeah. a lot of us have been in situations where someone has tried to convince us that a different uh, action would be a, a, an easier action to do um, and against our own better judgment and how we we take that discussion but, forwards yeah I, I, and again I think I think this is a this is around um, it's an education piece and 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 there might be times where it's appropriate to to compromise um, on you know, the, the particular action that is being required, but the the starting point from that action you know, can't be yeah you, know, you you you, know, you don't want to expose yourself to something that it, that takes away your credibility because ultimately you need to stand for something yeah so again I'm happy to take that offline if somebody wants to come back to me with that we could pick that up in more detail if there's a specific something you, you need to address. OK, I think I've got a last question here and I know you'll like this one. Um, the presentation is inspiring. Thank you very much. Um, it was great, Jonathan, um, especially how social media could be used. Talking about social media platforms to raise safety awareness or doing safety promotion, which side of safety should we push? The positive, how proud am I for doing it right? Or the negative, I should just have to avoid what others are doing. I guess the negative is about the, the, the injury side of things. What are your thoughts on that, Jonathan? I have a I have a bias towards the positive. So again, if you look through any of my any red laces content and any of my own personal content ever, um, I don't show those videos of somebody on a forklift truck, you know, balancing on a ladder and you know, could fall off the you know, kind of clickbait type stuff. I don't show any of that. Uh, I've never yet on red laces put anything on there about fines and costs uh, or sharing HSE type stuff. So uh, so so far, I've, I've not put anything of the I suppose the negative side of things. That's not to say you shouldn't. Um, and I think from, I think it's a balance, 
but you need to be clear about what your message is. What is it you're trying to share? Ultimately, um, coming away from health and safety and talking more about people, about risk, about environment, about innovation, all these kind of things we talked about today, it it's, it's, it's gets people curious. It starts a conversation. More often than not, um, talking the language, the traditional language of safety stops the conversation. Um, I mean, I've been on seven seven podcasts this year um the first one i was ever on was rebranded safety with james mcpherson and actually the topic of that conversation was compliance stops the conversation and we spent a whole hour pretty much saying <laughs> don't talk about compliance because because that just it just stopped the conversation um but it needs to it needs to be a balance essentially it's what value can you can you bring mm, yeah yeah, no, um, a lot of people agree with you. Uh, I think you're going to enjoy reading through the chat afterwards, Jonathan, because there's some some good points here. Thank you. Um, but I think we've probably come to the end. So thank you very much. Um, if you have any further questions, then please, you can either put them on the Swiss Net Network LinkedIn site. Um, you could email them to me. I gave my email address somewhere um, or go through Red Laces um, because we'd really like to keep going with this discussion. Um, particularly if you go to the Swiss Network LinkedIn site and tell us what you've thought about this discussion. So where are you doing influencing innovation um, and being inspiring? It would be great to have some, some good feedback and some, some good things that, that we can share on those. Um, because you know we all know health safety environment generally in an organization we don't have a large number of people who we are, are our direct reports and therefore to make a difference we have to be able to influence and we have to be able to do that effectively so it has been fantastic Jonathan thank you very much for sharing your thoughts on how we can get better at that because really it is the way for the future thank you thank you